Hello everyone, I'm David Kent with Kent Health Systems and we're going to take a few minutes here and look at seatbelt safety. It's very important how your body is actually held onto the seat when you're inside of a vehicle. Regardless of where you're going, whether you're just moving across a parking lot, driving across town, to the airport, or you're in a foreign country inside of a, some type of a taxi or some other type of vehicle. It's important that you're properly secured in place so that the vehicle is a safety cage around you and that if there is some type of incident or accident that you're not thrown, all of a sudden you'll become an object within the vehicle itself. So let's take a look at the skeleton for just a moment. When we sit, it's important that we sit on the ischial tuberosities of our nominate bones here. And as we're sitting down, I'm going to use this band to replicate a seat belt or a lap belt. So we'd want the lap belt coming low across the hips, across both the nominate bones, so that it's uh, actually below the ASIS, the anterior superior iliac spine then that's going to hold the pelvis securely in place. We want to make sure not only are we sitting on the ischial tuberosities, but the hips are back into the uh, seat itself. The back of the seat could be upright. Of course, we're gonna, you're going to see in the car, in the vehicle, we'll discuss, we want to make sure a slight little bend in the elbow, good distance from the steering wheel, at least 12 inches. If that airbag should open, we don't want it to uh, cause any type of trauma. We only want it to be uh, act as a safety mechanism that it was device that it was designed for. Now the chest strap needs to come across. As that comes across, we want it to uh, make sure that it's coming right across the clavicle, the midpoint of the clavicle, and right across the sternum and the rib cage. Now again, if the seat belt is not positioned right, as we're going to see in the car. That belt, when it, if, we're, if, if we're not secured in place and we're moving, then that belt could easily cut deep into the abdomen, and that's going to cause trauma to the uh, soft tissues above as well as the soft internal organs. So uh, we want to make sure that we're properly securing the seat belt in place. We'll take a look at those organs, actually. Let me hang this up. Got another model we want to bring in. Well, actually, we'll bring this out to the vehicle as well because as you're secured, again, you're going to see that we want to make sure that the lap belt is, is low. It's secured across the pelvis, not coming into the uh, viscera or any of the uh, abdominal organs getting uh, hurt by that. And then again, the chest belt, we want to make sure isn't low where the body's going to spin around. Actually, I'm going to put this back down. We're going to take a look at that skeleton one more time and we'll see it in the car when we place it in but if we have that that lap belt just the lap belt in place but we haven't properly secured maybe we've taken that shoulder strap and we put it under our shoulder or we put it behind the body even if you have the lap belt in place okay that's going to hold you but then you're going to swing forward and I've seen the cases where People have broken their teeth out in the steering wheel or hitting the dashboard or if the seat belt isn't secure and they're laid back, you know, they're kind of almost laying down with their seat backs and they can slide right out from under that seat belt. Depending on how they're hit, they could be ejected either way. And I've seen the results of this, so it's very important. Uh, I'll tell you for myself and anyone who's ever been in a vehicle with me, knows that I do make sure that, uh, that er everyone's properly wearing their seatbelt and that I am as well. So again, when we have the body secured, the axial skeleton properly uh, secured in place, then we're going to have minimal movement also with the head if we properly have the headrest position. So we want to make sure that we have that headrest position um, you know, if, if you go through the midpoint of the temple or at least the level of the eye, but we want the back of the head to definitely be hitting that headrest. Again, if the seat belt is loose, someone could lift up and then you're going to hit the, top, the, the ceiling of the car or uh, there's just going to be too much movement. So we want to keep that to a minimum as far as where the head's moving. Then again, the airbag opens, which minimizes uh, any other trauma that can take place. 
So let's take a few moments also, I want to talk about the uh, soft tissue uh, injuries that can take place. Even by a seatbelt when it's secured properly, uh, sometimes we still see certain myofascial uh, trigger points that uh, come in. Now, one thing that we want to make sure we do is uh, be thorough, take a postural analysis. Also, your smartphone can take a video so you could watch someone's gait and see how they're moving through space. Then once you have their posture, many times that will even be connected with their accident or it, 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 as far as where their pain is, help them understand. So like here, for example, um, let's say someone came in and you did take just a moment and I'll let them wear whatever clothes they're wearing at the moment. Uh, just do at least an anterior and a lateral uh, photograph so that we can see hey, are, is one shoulder higher than the other? Is one lower than the other? Is their head forward? Because if they're coming in with neck pain and back pain, just to rub where it hurts, we're treating the symptom. We want to make sure that we're addressing the cause. And part of that is doing a good assessment. And if it's been determined that it's soft tissue, that the pain is coming from soft tissue, then we want to make sure that we get the body or the structural, structural portion of the body in balance or structural homeostasis. So we have the mid-sagittal plane, we have the um, coronal plane as well. So like if we uh, set the body up and we were looking at someone's posture, for example, let's say they had a high shoulder on one side, a low shoulder on another side, it can help them start to understand why they have certain pain. Also, let's say, for example, they have a forward head posture. Well, just that forward head posture in itself can play a big role in um, causing their pain with the stress on the muscles on the back of the neck. Also, let's take a look at where that seatbelt should go. So remember that seatbelt should be very low across the at least for the, you know, and we're going to draw the driver's lap belt on this one. Um, so, but both of the lap belts will be low across the anominate and then uh, or across the pelvis. And then we have the lap belt coming across. So there again, it might make sense uh, based on their subjective complaints and where the belt was positioned. And then you see where the belt crosses. So right where the belt crosses, there are t a few myofascial trigger points that you should at least check and rule out and make sure they're not playing a role with someone's pain, especially if they're coming in and they're reporting uh, an area of pain going across the mid-thoracic region or the lower thoracic region and then also going across the uh, sacrum and the, uh, the anominate. So, or along the crest of the iliums as well. So uh, let's take a look here, for example, at the rectus abdominis. So the rectus abdominis here on this uh, image, what you see is the uh, X shows the common location of the trigger point uh, in the studies of doc from Dr. Travell and Simons. And then the red areas show the referrals uh, the, where people in the study reported pain, tingling, numbing, burning. Everyone will report their own unique phenomena. So we can see that the trigger point in the lower portion of the rectus abdominis referring here uh, posteriorly over the sacrum and across the crest of the ilium bilaterally. Also, this trigger point in the uh, upper portion of the rectus abdominis, you can see how that is referring right across the back. So many times the women will tell you that it feels like it's right across where their, um, the bra strap is going. But people will talk about a distinct band of pain across their back. And when they do, many times you can uh, spot some of the involvement of the muscle just based on your objective findings, looking at their posture and seeing how their shoulders have come forward. With that also, and again, the placement of where the belt is, thank God the belt was there because the belt saves a tremendous amount of people. And um, it, it's, it's amazing some of the, uh, um, I can assure you, I've seen the, the pictures of these vehicles of people did not have their seat belts on, they would not have survived or they would not have walked away with it with the minimal 
uh, injuries that 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 were uh, that they incurred. So um, again, you want to make sure that you're educating your patients. There's a few trigger points that you might also see uh, pectoralis. Um, major referring uh, down the upper extremity or distally down the upper extremity. And then we also might see the uh, pectoralis minor often involved. And then you're going to start to see if they're reporting neck pain and head pain, you might start, or and headaches. Uh, again, show them some of the trigger points that are involved in the head and neck. I'll show you a couple real quick here. So, for example, if someone came in and they had uh, temporal pain, for example, uh, trigger point number one in the upper trapezius is the most common trigger point in the body, as you can see right here. Uh, so it's important that the patient understand also that if you're working in their shoulder and they're feeling a headache or pain into their head, that they understand that what's going on is you're not pressing on a nerve, you're not doing anything wrong, so I want to educate people before I start that we may come across what's known as a myofascial trigger point. And that even though you've come in with head pain and you've got neck pain, I could be out working in your shoulders, working on the upper trapezius for, you know, you and I understand that, but the patient doesn't understand what muscles we're on and they don't understand something like trigger points. So I want to let them know prior to therapy that uh, especially if they've been referred to you by a physician, the, the physician's already definitely determined that it's soft tissue in nature and possibly that uh, myofascial trigger points are involved, or maybe they have already determined myofascial trigger points are definitely involved. So it's important that the patient understands what does that mean so that they realize that when you press out here and you've recreated their referred phenomena that you've identified, and they recognize it, that you've identified an active trigger point, for example. So I take a moment and go through with the patients, letting them know the different layers on the back of the neck, uh, letting them know that, uh, showing them the different layers so that they can realize that today we may not be able to treat through all the layers and get to the deepest ones, like the suboccipitals, for example. So I'll let them see some of these patterns and let them know, hey, right, you're having pain into your temporal region. And, you know, again, these different muscles like the uh, semispinalis capitis we can see here referring from uh, the back. There's three common trigger point locations uh, referring uh, into the uh, temporal region. We also have over here the... Uh, splenius capitis also referring up into the uh, temple and then that deepest layer so it's important that they understand all these different layers of muscles that need to be released and treated till you can even get to these uh, deepest muscles the suboccipital so that they can again see these referral patterns so let's take a moment, we'll go outside, we're going to get into the vehicle, we'll take a look at uh, these models in the vehicle, and then I want to make sure that you apply the, this information for yourself and then pass it on to uh, your clients and patients. Let's go. So we're just going to take a few moments to talk about some of the tips that we can pass on to our patients for the many hours that they spend inside of their vehicles, how they can be safe ergonomically set correctly and take care of themselves between treatments. Um, as you can see, you know, anytime we're in a vehicle, it's important how we have the steering wheel set. For example, we want to make sure that we have a full 12 inches between our body and the steering wheel. Of course, we want to make sure that we're sitting properly on our ischial tuberosities, and we're going to take a look at that here in just a moment. Also, the position of the seat belt is very important, how it's positioned on our patients uh, as well as ourselves, whether we're just um, in a taxi cab moving from the airport somewhere or we're crossing a parking lot from one end to another uh, between stores, possibly just uh, driving around town or driving across the country. At all times, it's very important that we are positioned correctly. These airbags open at a very fast rate. It's very important we don't have food in our mouth. Uh, you know, we don't expect an accident to happen, but if we're eating food and that airbag opens and somebody hits us, it can be life-threatening. Also, our distance away uh, is very important. If we're sitting up very close and that airbag opens, 
Again, it's opening up at hundreds of miles an hour, and um, it's going to definitely cause some type of trauma, as well as the position of our hands. You know, if you have your hand across the steering wheel, again, as we're doing different movements, we want to make sure that our hands aren't in a position where they can, again, be thrown to hit us, whereas otherwise the airbag can throw it out. So let's take a look at some of the position. First, we're gonna start and talk about the seatbelt. Of course, we're positioned in a manner where we discussed we have a good distance between the uh, steering wheel and, and our body. We wanna make sure that our body is uh, held in place properly. You know, during a vehicle, this is really just one of the laws of physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And just like when you shoot, um, if you're playing billiards and shooting a pool ball and it goes into another ball, that energy transfers from one ball into another and moves on. Same thing happens during a car accident. If we're still and then another vehicle comes and hits us from behind, that kinetic energy has been transferred into our vehicle and into our body. So the purpose of the seat belt is to keep our body in place, of course, protect us within this cage that the vehicle has created for us and part of that is that our body's properly protected and properly harnessed in place so we want to make sure that the seat belt is very low across the hip we don't want it high if it's high i'm going to show you in a moment how that can go into the abdominal organ so we want the seat belt low and we want it across the hip we want to make sure that the shoulder harness is coming across the chest, it's actually coming across the clavicle, and it's holding us in place. Sometimes people will put the seatbelt under their body. Now what starts to happen? If you have the seatbelt high and low, I'm going to show you basically you're just, the, the body is just in a position where when there's trauma, you're going to automatically start to really spin and then also this belt's going to cut in in very deep internally and, and injure organs so that's why it's it's designed a certain way it's designed to go across the chest and we're going to take a look at that next also we want to make sure that our arms have a slight bend but we're if we were turning the wheel we're moving the wheel you know our arms we still would always have contact with it there again, crossing our, you know, we want to make sure that we're using proper ergonomics whenever we're driving. And uh, so let's move on. We're going to take a look at how the seatbelt uh, actually holds the axial skeleton, our, our, our bones in place when we're driving. So as we can see here, the skeleton, the axial skeleton of the body, the bones are actually held in place with the seatbelt. If we have the seatbelt low, it's going to be coming across the anominate bones or the, the bones that help to form the pelvis. Um, and then we can also see that this uh, harness is coming across the rib cage, right across the clavicle, and then that's helping to keep the whole uh, torso in place. And when all that's positioned right, then there's just going to be very little movement of the head. Of course, the airbag can open. If it, we're in the right position, there's going to be minimal movement, and that's what's so important. There again, as we can see, if this is low, see how it's going to cut into the organs. Or if the lower belt is too high, there again, we can see how it's going to go very deep. And we're going to take another look at another model because I really want to make sure that you understand how important it is that we're positioned correctly at all times. So now that we have this model in place, it's going to be easy for you to realize how important it is because actually what we have on this model, if we if I take it, actually I'm just going to unseat belt it a little bit so that we can take a look. So really the rib cage here, there we go. So the rib cage is actually protecting our lungs and our heart. Right here we have the diaphragm muscle, which is attaching along the ribs. And then here we can see the liver, we have the um, intestines here, here we have the ascending, the transverse, and descending colon. So, of course, we don't want the seat belt, if it's too high, if it's not down um, along by the anominate bones, 
coming across the rib cage, that seatbelt's going to cut into these internal organs. Thank you for joining me. I wish you uh, good health, happiness. Uh, pass on some of these tips to your patients. Apply them yourself. I'm David Kent. I look forward to seeing you soon.